Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. James Chernowski, Senior Tech and Innovation Policy Analyst at Americans for Prosperity and also commentator for Young Voices. Good to have you, James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, we're going to chop it up about Donald Trump's lawsuit against social media companies. And let's also talk about Russia and their now interplay with social media as well. There's a night and day contrast. I think some interesting commentary can come out of it. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about Trump's lawsuit. So if you would give us your sentiment and I will opine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, when it comes to Donald Trump's lawsuit against the social media companies, uh, late uh, last year he had unveiled that lawsuit against Twitter, Google, and Facebook for uh, getting deplatformed from these from these social media companies. Uh, he felt that he had been wronged and censored, and he opened it up as a class action lawsuit for others to join him in doing so. I think that this lawsuit is without merit. Uh, I think that Mr. Trump. Got himself removed from private property, unsurprisingly, when he repeatedly violated the terms of service that these companies have on their websites. And that this lawsuit should, at least in theory, not move forward much beyond where it's at right now. Though I anticipate that knowing former President Trump that he will probably appeal this and try to keep the fight going as long as humanly possible. I agree with everything you just said, but let me ask you this question. I believe Trump is doing this simply to raise money because I'm positive every lawyer around him, they have expressed to him, you cannot win this lawsuit. This is not a violation of your first amendment. This is not some freedom of speech violation whatsoever. As you just said, correctly so, this is the equivalent of him being kicked off of private property. And here's the other thing, he signed a user agreement. He literally signed a user agreement that said, hey, if you do A, B, and C, we could just say bye bye. It's a user agreement, it's a contract. That contract is enforceable. And then you have Rule 230, which basically says listen, social media platforms must engage in good faith efforts to regulate the content on their platforms so that it's not, you know, harassing or criminal activity is not taking place. And as long as they engage in good faith efforts to regulate that content to make sure it's not a safe haven for crime or ex- extreme harassment, then those social media companies, they will have immunity from prosecution when they make those good faith efforts. And let's remember the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression also applies to private companies, right? They can express their speech as well. So why do you think with all of this simple evidence, none of this stuff is complex, right? All of this very simple, here's the rule evidence. Why do you think so many Republicans in particular believe that Trump's lawsuit is going to not only win, but be a game changer as it relates to the rule of law and social media censorship in America? I think that's a great question. I don't know if all Republicans share the views of the former president in terms of- No, 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 you're right, not all brother, that's why I didn't say all, but why do so many? Yeah, so I, I do think that that lawsuit and, and its outcome is not necessarily a universally shared view. I think that part of the reason that people hold out hope that maybe it can be successful is that there is a feeling among conservatives that they are being targeted by these social media companies for the content that they are posting on their websites. Now, whether or not that's actually true or not is something that's entirely separate. I think that the data there is actually not necessarily holding up to any kind of scrutiny whatsoever. I think that conservatives have benefited greatly from the prevalence of having social media available to them. So I think that when it comes to Donald Trump and and his lawsuit here, I think it's about raising awareness about what he views to be perceived slights by these social media companies directed against him and conservatives. As he's often said in the past, he he wants to be the focal point of the attacks because he views himself as like one of the unspoken people. Um, so therefore, I think that he views it as an opportunity to certainly I think drive drive attention to it in that fashion. I just don't think that the evidence is there to support it. And like you mentioned with Section 230, it's actually a very simple procedural law. They're focusing on this law because they think it's what empowers these companies to take the actions that they did against President Trump. But that's actually false. The thing that drove those companies rights to take the action they did was the First Amendment. That is clear as day to anybody who reads the law. All Section 230 says is that for you as a platform, 
you're not going to be held liable as long as, as you said, you're taking those uh, you know efforts in good faith to keep illegal content off the internet. That you know the federal crimes. Um, you're not going to be held liable for the posts of your users, and that's actually quite important when we want to talk about facilitating a digital ecosystem that actually empowers more speech on the internet. Yeah, and I think you speak to a larger dynamic. Once again, I'm in complete agreement with what you said. The only caveat that I would add to that is when you say, okay, Trump did this to bring awareness. I don't think he really did it to bring just awareness. I really think he did it to bring more money to him. He has fundraised off of this and the attorneys that are filing the lawsuit, they are fundraising as well. I mean, everybody's getting paid from this. You see the emails that go out saying, we need this money to continue to fight the social media monopoly, et cetera, et cetera. Donate $5 today or donate $20 for the rest of your life. And all of these emails are generated based on it. Now, this hypocrisy must be told. He created, Trump created something called Truth Social. Trump is the man who's leading, it's not even a class action lawsuit, by the way, that's another lie. A judge has to declare something to be a class action lawsuit. You can't just file one, so that's already a lie. So he files this lawsuit, he says, social media companies should not have the right to deplatform a person based on what they share content wise. He then creates what he calls a free flowing forum, Truth Social. In the first week of Truth Social, they deplatform individuals under the same theory of law and application. Tell me, brother, because you have plenty of walking around sense, as my grandmother would say. How in the hell don't Republicans see the hypocrisy of this entire move by Donald Trump? I think it's an interesting question to say the least as to why Donald Trump has done what he's done. Truth Social did launch, you are absolutely right. That is a new product that's out there and I'm actually happy to see it out there only because it offers an alternative way of looking at how you can approach the the But James, that's the solution, right? It's a free market solution. Yeah. That's it. That's your solution. Go out, be competitive, create a product you know, you build it, they will come kind of stuff. Not yeah. literally being antithetical to the Constitution while tricking those who have a good faith belief in you to give you money for a case that's doomed from day one. No, I think I don't think you're wrong there. I think that him creating Truth Social is a positive step in the right direction in terms of forming an alternative out there. Though, as you mentioned, his platform in the short term that it's already been allowed is already started, you know, deplatforming people. Famously, Devin Nunes's cow, which is a Twitter account that parodied right. Devin Nunes, went on there and got banned pretty fast. Lo and behold, and there have certainly been complaints of censorship, if you will, about this platform. But if you read through the terms of service, it's actually very detailed as to what they're willing to take you down for. You can't make fun of the former president of the United States. You can't make fun of the actual service itself. You can't sit there and over excessively use capitalizations, which I know some people are fond of using, I guess. And it's it's very fascinating. It's a different perspective of dealing with it. And that's his right. And I think that you know that's where the better served judgment is. And I think as that platform grows more popular over time, which it will, as the former president starts using it, I think. I think that it offers up an opportunity for Republicans to recognize perhaps some of the flaws in their attacks on big tech right now when it comes to looking at section 230 particularly. Yeah, let me talk about Russia. Yeah. Um, and Russia authorities have now called um, Metaverse, uh, labeled them an extremist organization. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, I think that when it comes to Russia looking at the situation with Meta and other companies, it is not surprising in the slightest. Very early on when Russia invaded Ukraine, these platforms were actually really devastating to Putin's ability to establish any form of credibility for his reasoning for invading Ukraine. I think that they showed us in live time the just sheer destruction of war, because we have not seen that, like at least in the kind of intimate detail that we have for some time, probably like when we were last looking at Yemen and some of that area where we would have seen this even a little bit. But given the the sheer amount of force that Putin's using, it's gotten exposed in part because of these social media platforms and it undermines his message. So therefore, it's not surprising that when these platforms have demonetized the, the Russians propaganda arm like Reuters and Sputnik to be able to make any kind of money off of it. 
uh, and they're lowering the rankings on their searches, etc. That you know, Putin views that as an attack on him and his credibility as the leader of Russia to go and actually do anything. And therefore, he's taken the radical actions of starting to go and ban uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter from internet access for Russians, which is a, which is really unfortunate because now they're not able to go and see the same kind of information that we can, uh, which makes it harder. But luckily enough, people saw it early and often. And I think as recently, it was over 3,000 people that have gotten arrested in Russia for protesting this war in Ukraine. They have courageously stood up to Vladimir Putin. And my thoughts and prayers are actually with these companies who have employees that are located in Russia that had to go and make that hard decision about how they want to go and approach this situation because they do have folks on the ground there. So my thoughts and prayers are with those people. Let me draw some parallels here that I find interesting. The first war is always a psychological war. Mm -hmm. You have to control the narrative, there's a sales pitch typically, you need to get buy in, all of that is very psychological. So Vladimir Putin controlling information by determining that social media is now extremist and it is anti-Russia, that's to control, control the message. That's to limit information to those in Russia, number one. But look at this parallel. You literally have a former president of the United States who praises the leadership of Vladimir Putin. You have a conservative demographic, not all conservatives, but a significant number of conservatives who have praised Vladimir Putin. Just a couple of weeks ago, Marjorie Taylor Greene, a US Congresswoman, spoke at a white nationalist rally and they were shouting Putin, Putin and let's go Russia. That's what they were shouting at that rally. Look at this parallel. They say that social media, according to the Republicans, should not be regulated by the government. And I agree, it is not regulated by the government. It is not being controlled by the government. And the government is not telling Facebook what to do or what to limit. However, Russia is. Russia is doing exactly what the conservatives are saying is evil. Russia is actually doing exactly what Republicans are saying represents antithetical relationships between community and social media. And none of them have any negative words to say about Vladimir Putin doing what they have deemed to be evil. Yeah, I think that you you raise an excellent point there when it comes to the parallels. I think that Vladimir Putin definitely is taking the actions that he is right now in no small part because he wants to control the narrative of what's unfolding in Ukraine, especially when it's inward facing to the people of Russia. I think you care less about how the world perceives him. That's right. He certainly is doing what he thinks is best in his opinion and he just wants to control what the people of Russia can see. When it comes to Republicans in America, again, I don't think that it is a large portion. I actually think that it's just a very loud vocal minority that have learned how to go. But here's the problem, James. Voices. James, I agree with you, brother. I think yeah. the Republican Party has a loud vocal minority of individuals who are hardcore Russian supporters, Vladimir Putin supporters, right? Yeah. But here's the here's the other side of that coin. When you're silent, when you refuse to uh, proclaim the truth. Because you are afraid of the loud voices, who represents you then? Those loud voices do. Because now the only chorus we hear is the chorus of the minority group because you refuse to sing your own song. No, I think that's a completely valid point. And that's why I'm, I'm proud to do the kind of work that I do working in tech policy. Because I want to make sure that people know that it's not just that one voice in the room, that there are other diverse and rich opinions within the conservative movement or the center right movement. I don't want to go and make it seem like um, you know, it's these, these far radical loud voices that are a minority that drive this. I think that unfortunately for conservatives, there's just this big rage towards technology companies that I think that if they keep pushing for the kinds of solutions that they're they're going for that they're going to lose out at the end of the day because yeah. again the internet has been one of the biggest boons for conservative voices that have been there and it's also empowered by the way you know even networks like the Young Turks and I love to see that and I want to see more of that but that requires something that I think there's very little patience of in DC and that is patience and and really needing to learn how to go and take things slow and tone down the rhetoric that's definitely I think one of the hardest things to do but it is the necessary thing to do because again we all benefit when we can learn how to 
you know, operate and have good conversations. And the internet is a great medium for making that happen. That's why things like Section 230 are so critical towards him, you know, allowing for free speech to occur on the internet. And Russia is an exact example of why that's detrimental for countries right. that don't have those protections. You know, man, I'm rooting for you, James. And let me tell you why I'm rooting for you. Right now, the Republican Party is so extreme and so dangerous and so insane in their ideology and their um, their um, romanticism of white nationalism that Democrats can get away with anything. That literally a Democrat can run and say, I'm gonna do this, do that, do the other. Four years later, they don't do a damn thing. And then when they come up for reelection, all they have to say is, who are you gonna vote for, me or that guy? We lose in that scenario, brother. We lose in that scenario every time. So you guys need to come back to the table and stop letting these loonies hijack your damn party. I think that that's why Glenn Youngkin was a great example of what happens when conservatives find their base again. Mm. Um, he was he was a very milk toast campaign, but he ran on a very digestible and simple message that people could resonate with, and he was able to go and defeat the Democrat incumbent, uh, you know, Democratic governor uh, that was going to be there. And well, and was, one of the things uh, the Democratic governor did is connect the entire campaign to national democratic politics and the national political brand of the Democratic Party has yeah. suffered severely under the presidency of Donald Trump. It was not a wise move. That's why you see people like gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams in Georgia. She's running a Georgia centric campaign. Yeah. So much so that when Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris came to Georgia, she all of a sudden had a scheduling conflict. All right, man, I appreciate you being on the show, man. Very smart guy, thank you. Thanks for having me.